Biana, I will actually hand off the virtual microphone to the Community Involvement Coordinator for the Upper Columbia River site, Kay Morrison. Thank you so much, Julie. Um, this is Kay Morrison, Community Involvement Coordinator, and I'll be facilitating tonight. Um, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Before we um, turn to Robert and Mark for the presentation, I'd like to acknowledge Citizens for a Clean Columbia and the Lake Roosevelt Forum. CCC and the Lake Roosevelt Forum have been key partners to us for much of our work in the Upper Columbia River, and their continuous leadership has strongly encouraged us to make this presentation tonight, focusing on the draft Human Health Risk Assessment, and to help the broader community understand more generally about our work and to have the opportunity to provide us with feedback about this key decision document. We don't plan at this point to hold in-person meetings about the risk assessment um, as we adjust to the evolving COVID-19 situation. So decisions about continuing on-site activities will be made on a case-by-case -case basis. We're, we are working closely with our local, state, and tribal partners to evaluate options for continuing site work or securing sites, especially in areas where local health declarations are in effect due to the COVID-19. Thank you for your patience and understanding. And that's it for me. I'm going to hand it over to Robert. Hello, everyone. This is Robert Tan with the Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, thank you, Kay and Julie, for your help setting this up and uh, helping iron out the technical kinks of working through a web public meeting. So before we get into this, I did want to thank everyone who, who's participating remotely for uh, being guinea pigs, so to speak, on, on this virtual public meeting format. Uh, I know everyone at EPA were evolving on a day-to-day, -day, almost hourly basis, um, adjusting to COVID measures and um, ways that we can continue our work while uh, still proceeding safely and adhering to social distancing requirements. So today's presentation is going to be jointly presented by me and Mark Stifelman, who's our lead project toxicologist. I am the project, well, one of two project managers on the Upper Columbia River. Uh, my role is specifically on the human health risk assessment, which as Kay mentioned, is the primary focus of today's presentation. We are joined, um, we are joined by a, a team of support staff, contractors, and key project partners. Um, I won't read off every name, um, but you may see a list of people in the presenter section. EPA is joined by SRC, our contractor on the Human Health Risk Assessment Report. Uh, we also have a lot of our key stakeholders and partners, um, members from the Washington State Department of Ecology, Washington Department of Health, National Park Service, and our tribal partners, both from the Spokane Tribe of Indians and the Confederated Tribes of the Cultural Reservation. We're also joined by staff representatives from Tech American. Uh, Chris McKegg, to name one, who is currently um, a key partner in the project. The project. And as we get to the Q and A portion of this, which um, is, we'll, we'll take a couple breaks throughout the slides to answer any questions as they come into the chat box. Um, we may call upon some of our partners to help uh, answer some of the questions. So, for those of you uh, following along offline. Um, we are on slide three, the topic slide. And during today's presentation, we will spend a little bit of time providing a, some context and site history on the Upper Columbia River site. Um, we'll then talk about the remedial investigation and feasibility study process. We've tried to steer clear of the acronyms that ETA is guilty of using on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, but one important one you may see, well, two important ones you may see, First off, UCR representing Upper Columbia River, and the RIFS, which stands for Remedial Investigation and Feasibility Study. And that's the overall process uh, follows our environmental laws in conducting remedial investigations and, and site characterizations. I'll then pass the microphone off to Mark Stifelman to talk about the human health risk assessment process, what exactly a human health risk assessment is, and then provide the key summary or the summary of key results. Last, we'll provide uh, an update on the process to provide to submit public feedback on the Human Health Risk Assessment Report, which is currently available for public review, and we will be accepting comments through July 24th. 
I advance to the fourth slide, the upper Columbia River site, it is uh, what we refer to commonly as a megasite in the sense that it covers a very expansive geographic distance. Um, we're interested in the stretch of the Columbia River all the way from the north, uh, the, all the way from the Canadian border in the north, all the way down south to the Grand Coulee Dam. It's about 150 river miles. And then the site also includes potentially impacted upland portions. Um, from aerial deposition and other pollution, pollutant sources. We have to date conducted a number of upland soil sampling and fortunately the majority of upland contamination is really limited to the northeast portion of the site as you can see on, by the dashed lines in the up top right corner of that slide. So the primary source that really triggered this remedial investigation process was concern from the trail smelter, which is up located in Trail BC. And it is a historic smelting operation that's um, operated for over 100 years. And it has historically and currently smelted a, a number of different heavy metals, including copper and gold, um, lead, zinc, and, uh, and other metals. We're concerned primarily during operations from pollution that was discharged directly into the river and then also aerial deposition from those smokestacks. So pollutants that were emitted and have uh, traveled down the natural river valley. While the trail smelter really kickstarted this process, it is important to recognize that the upper Columbia River is home to a, a number of other potential sources, um, including mines, mills, and other smelters, one that many of you might be familiar with is the Leroy smelter in Northport, which operated intermittently for, um, for a couple periods of time at the turn of the 20th century. So I am on the next slide, slide six. And what this slide shows is the typical remedial process that we use to characterize sites consistent with our environmental laws. It all starts with uh, the identification of a problem, whether or not there is a problem, whether, whether or not there's the potential for a release in the environment. If so, what does that look like? And who do we need to work with to investigate? Moving down to the fourth step, um, which is highlighted by that red box, that is the what and where is the risk. And that is where the primary, the bulk of uh, environmental data is collected, oftentimes in the field. And it uh, really helps us to, it's during this stage that we really characterize where the contamination is and whether or not it is um, located in uh, a specific area or at specific quantities to um, present a potential risk to public health and the environment. All of this information is then bottled into our remedial investigation report and is used to determine whether or not any remedial action is warranted or needed. Um, if so, we move on to the next stage there running on the bottom of the slide, and that is the proposed plan, um, the proposal of what actions will be taken, a record of decision, and then ultimately, if we are moving into remedial action, um, that's at the last step in the process. So today, we are focusing specifically on the human health risk assessment while it's in, uh, while it's, while it's in draft and available for public review. There is another key piece of the remedial investigation that is currently ongoing, and that is the baseline ecological risk assessment, which focuses on impacts or potential impacts to plants and wildlife, including fish and other benthic organisms in the sediment. Uh, ultimately, both of these separate reports will be synthesized into the remedial investigation report. We moved on to slide eight. And since we began this process uh, more than a decade ago, we really needed to collect, um, conduct a number of different separate investigations that were necessary to feed into the risk assessment report. So the name of a few of these included public beach sediment sampling, surface water sampling, tribal, the Colville Tribal Survey, um, the Recreational Use Survey, upland soil sampling, residential soil and beach reconnaissance and sampling, fish, mussel, crayfish, and plant sampling, and then an ongoing investigation is our soil amendment technology evaluation study. And really, all of these are, are you know, 
combined to make and, and conduct our human health risk assessments. They're needed to estimate the quantity of contamination, the potential exposure concentrations, and um, ultimately how people are using the site and where they may come in contact with the contamination. <clears throat> I'm on slide nine, and along the way, as we have identified, EPA and our partners have identified the contamination at sufficient quantities and locations to present a potential imminent threat to public health. Uh, we have worked with our partners to take action. This includes the black sand beach removal, the cleanup conducted in 2010. Uh, in 2012, the Bosford Beach area was closed to public access due to elevated lead concentrations in soil and sediment. We've worked with the Washington Department of Health to update the Upper Columbia River and Lake Roosevelt fish consumption advisories based on the results and data from a fish tissue sampling. And then Tech, uh, Tech American has taken action at residential properties based on results from residential soil sampling. Um, and that resulted in a total of 18 properties that were cleaned in 2015, 2017, and 2018. Um, at properties that exceeded our, our highest threshold for time-sensitive cleanup actions. And then last, EPA has historically conducted cleanups in the Northport area due to contamination and proximity to the Leroy smelter. And we are currently in the process of working with the city, residents, and county to conduct a second round of cleanups um, to take place later this year and early next year. So at that point, I will just take a pause, um, see if we have any questions come in. Does not look like we have. Um, so I'll use this as a reminder. If folks have questions, feel free to submit them through the Q&A pod. It should be in the bottom left corner there. Uh, we will have an opportunity at the end of the presentation to, uh, for folks to take their lines off of mute and, and provide comments directly if folks uh, prefer to save their questions towards the end of the presentation. So that said, I will hand the phone off to Mark Seifelman. Okay, thank you, Robert. I'm just gonna pause a second to see um, on the chat box if hopefully you can hear me, it's hard to know. We can hear you great, Mark. Um, and okay, we do actually you, have, if, if you have just a second, we do have a question um, from Mindy Smith. Is it okay if I go ahead and read that? Oh yeah, go ahead, Claire. Um, okay, so the question is probably for Robert. Um, Mindy asks, why has nothing been done to remediate Bosberg? So th thank you, Mindy, for the question. Um, that and, you know, I don't know if we have anyone from the National Park Service who can, who can chime in. Um, if so, we can circle back on this at the end of the presentation. Uh, but the, the short sense is in our remedial process, uh, unless there is the imminent, immediate public health risk, we do are at the end of the process is, is when we make the decisions on cleanup actions or immediate alternatives. Um, so to protect public health in the short term, it was determined back in 2012 that the uh, best way to do that until we have a proposed plan and remedial action um, is determined that uh, restricting public access was the, the best interim action at the time being. Thanks for that question. If anyone else has questions, please put them in the Q&A box. Um, and if, you, um, if you'd like to ask questions on the phone, um, we'll open the phone lines up in a little bit. OK, Mark, so like um, this is, thank you, Kay. This is Mark Steifelman. Um, and I'm going to just talk a little bit more about um, what Robert introduced, which is the human health risk assessment. Um, and for those who are following along and don't, can't see the screen, we're on slide 10. So the human health risk assessment is what it sounds like. It, it assesses risk, that is, the possibility of harm to people from pollution in the environment. Um, and because of this site, we have a lot of health concerns about lead. We also have some concerns about chemicals that, are, that cause cancer or carcinogens, and then other chemicals that cause other non-cancer health effects. And I just break them out separately because um, in the document, we kind of have to keep score three ways separately. There, there are different types of health effects um, 
and they're not exactly additive. And I'll come back to that in a little bit more detail. Um, but basically, the study uses um, information collected from the site, which Robert really identified those studies. Um, most of those studies are studies of the site, where we actually sample water in the river, we sample sediment in the river, sediment on the beaches, soil in the yards. We sampled, I believe, 10 different species of, species of fish, plants, crayfish, and mussels. So, so we're, we're looking at the concentrations of chemicals and pollutants in the environment. And we also conducted two large surveys to figure out how people are exposed to those chemicals in the environment. And specifically, we did one large survey targeting the recreational population around the Upper Columbia River inclusive, but actually larger than Lake Roosevelt. And then we did a similar large study on targeting the residents of the Confederated Tribes of the Colville Indian Reservation. Um, so that's really the piece of the study. We study the environment, and we study how people interact and move with the environment. Um, and then we combine that with um, toxicity data, which um, it doesn't really come from us. That comes from national databases that we use to compare those exposures to the toxicity information to see if we have a problem that we need to act upon. Again, the whole point of this study is it's not an academic or a research study. It's really, it gets back to the, what Robert talked about earlier. Do we have a problem? And what do we need to do to solve that problem to make the environment safe for people? So I am now moving on. So the next slide, um, slide 11. Um, okay, so um, we spend a lot of time in the risk assessment evaluating exposure pathways. Um, and that's just the term we use. That's how um, chemicals in the environment, that is chemicals in the world, um, enter your body. Um, and they, they enter your body um, by eating them, and you could eat them either intentionally, like you'd sit down and eat a meal of fish or plants or, or perhaps deer, um, but there's also incidental ingestion, and that's when we actually do ingest um, dirt and soil um, and even river water when we go swimming without the intent to actually ingest it. Um, and if you don't believe that, it's especially now with, with the COVID virus, we're all washing our hands a lot. We're probably washing our hands so often that we can't see it, but normally when you wash your hands, you could see when the water comes off your hands, it's, it's, it's a little bit brownish. And that's really, that represents inadvertent ingestion. In, inadvertent ingestion, it's the really small particles of dirt and dust on your hands um, that you could eat without thinking about it. And this is especially, it affects everybody, but it especially affects young children, which are a population of concern. Um, you're also exposed to chemicals by inhalation through breathing air, and then to a much lesser extent by just touching things. It's possible that chemicals or absorbed directly through your skin. Um, but again, the order in the slide represents the exposure potential. So the largest exposure potential is really intentionally eating things, as well as unintentionally ingesting soil and sediment, um, followed by um, breathing air or, um, or dermal absorption, having chemicals um, enter your body directly through the skin. Um, moving on to slide 12. Um, the risk assessment is organized by groups of people representing the different ways people can be exposed on the Upper Columbia River site. Um, so generally, the population of the most concern is residents because that's where you live. So that's where you spend the most time. And just that time factor really makes the pollution you experience at home greater than the pollution you might get at work or a recreational visit. Um, and that's especially true with lead, where the population of concern are very young children. Um, but we looked at all different groups in the risk assessment. We looked at workers. Um, we looked at recreational visitors. And we also looked at tribal populations. Um, and they're different, so we looked at them separately. So in the report, there are separate appendices, one for the Confederated Tribes of the Colville Indian Reservation, um, as, well as, the Spokane Indian, as well as the Spokane Tribe of Indians. And they're very different places, they're very different peoples, and so those are really two separate reports that are part of the human health risk assessment. And, and those are very collaborative with each of those tribes, all nations. Uh, so moving on to slide 13, um, the title of that slide is Chemicals of Potential Concern, which is just the universe of chemicals that we looked at in the risk assessment. And we really evaluated um, more than 26 um, chemicals or families of chemicals. Um, and again, 
we have to look at that um, differently depending on whether it's lead or non-lead cancer or another adverse effect. Um, so we do it differently for lead. Um, lead is an unusual toxin. We don't have a toxicity value to compare it with directly. We can't say this exposure is above this toxicity because really what we've learned over the years is any level of lead is, is toxic and it's really a continue, it's a continuous effect, especially on young children. So we look at lead exposure um, by estimating blood lead levels and we use software to do that so we don't need to test blood of people. Um, and what's unique about lead is because the exposures aren't just, um, we're, we're all exposed to lead kind of in everyday life, both from the site and just background levels of lead that occur in the food, in the air, the soil, and the water. Um, so all that's combined for us to predict a blood lead level, and that's a big part of the risk assessment. Um, and then for the other chemicals, it's more straightforward. We just estimate that exposure. And if it's a non-cancer effect, um, we use a threshold approach, meaning we have a dose that we compare it to. And if we're below that dose, we're very confident that there is no adverse effect. Um, the flip side is if we're slightly above that dose, that it's also unlikely if there's an adverse effect. It's, it's difficult to draw that line. Um, and then with carcinogens, it's also we, a small exposure is associated with a very small cancer risk. Um, and generally, we define our problem at EPA as if that cancer risk would increase your chance of cancer over the course of a lifetime by greater than 1 in 10,000. Uh, so I think I actually spoke through the next slide, which is 14, so I'm going to move on to slide 15. 14 just explains um, the information. So when we assess risks for lead, um, we convert those risks into estimated blood lead levels. And our target population, we look at everyone, but we're mostly concerned with very young, um, really preschool children. Um, but we don't have a clear threshold level at this point um, in our agency. So throughout the risk assessment, we actually look at three different blood lead levels um, at three, five, and eight. And the symbol stands for micrograms, or millionths of a gram per deciliter, um, or 10 milliliters. Um, and so there's a correspondence. So at the lowest benchmark of three micrograms per deciliter, that corresponds to um, a residential soil um, concentration of 50 parts per million. Um, and a small increase in blood lead level from three to five um, increases that corresponding soil lead level um, greatly. So five micrograms per deciliter, I'll call that the middle benchmark. Um, that corresponds to 200 parts per million and so on, with a high benchmark at eight micrograms per deciliter which is 400 parts per million. So throughout the risk assessment, we, we express those results in those three benchmarks. Um, but I'm really focusing more on the middle and the high um, because that low benchmark is so low, it's exceeded so widely. Um, and it's, it's a point of comparison, but they're really, um, even though we haven't made a decision, it's very unlikely that we'd take action at those very low levels of environmental lead um, because that would require us to take action virtually everywhere. Uh, so slide 16, um, it might, there's a lot of information on this slide, um, but it's just, it's intended to be a big picture overview of the results of the risk assessment. Um, and so what this really means is we don't have any um, unacceptable cancer risks um, for any of the populations we look at. And similarly, for outdoor workers, um, they aren't a concern. So the rest of what I'm really going to talk about is, is where we do have exceedances. And those exceedances are primarily concentrated for the residents because we're assuming almost full-time exposure for very young children. So that's a worst case scenario. So if a residence is safe for a very young child, it's really safe for everybody. Um, and one of the things we've learned is that um, beaches are generally cleaner than yards. So if you're spending some of your time either on a private beach or a public beach, that actually reduces your risk relative to spending all your time on a property with contaminated soil. Um, and similarly, we looked at current residential use and future residential use, um, and I'll get to that a little bit later. Um, and then with the recreational exposure, 
while there are some exceedances, they're much less than residential. Um, and really, as Mindy brought out, um, the site that we're most concerned with, um, and we do recognize the need to take action there, um, is Bossburg, which has been closed ever since we had the, the sampling results that indicated it was much higher than any other location throughout the river. Um, moving on to so slide Mark, 17. I'm, I'm going to pause you real quick. This is Robert Tan. I'm going to pause because we did receive a question in the Q&A box. Um, yeah, sure. Rick, Thank you. And, and he asks, will risk assessment include probability and impact scoring so the public can see how mitigation plans are rationalized? Um, so I, I can take the first stab, and then Mark, if you want to add on. Um, so the, what the risk assessment does do, again, I, I should have emphasized this earlier on, the risk assessment in of itself is not the decision document. The decision document comes later with the proposed plan and a record of decision. Uh, what the risk assessment does is it compares it, um, the uh, estimated risk of the site, um, to EPA's risk assessment benchmarks that Mark had a chance to discuss on his previous slides there. And, you know, to the extent that those um, risk benchmarks are probabilistic, I think Mark can probably expand on that. Um, but that comparison is included in the risk assessment. Right. Um, so this is Mark. I'm not sure I understand the impact scoring. So, um, I mean, the risk assessment shows the results in detail. So you could see um, the concentrations at different beaches. Um, and we also summarized um, the risk for residential at relative to those three benchmarks that I described earlier. So I'm not sure if that, I hope that answers or at least starts to answer your question. If not, we'll, um, we might need to get back to you because that's, and, and as far as mitigation plans, um, as Robert summarized, so where we had high concentrations, we've taken action early. Um, and then I think where you say mitigation, we use the term remediation, and that's, um, that, that's what we're looking forward to in subsequent steps, which Robert will also talk to in the, in the presentation. But that's where we develop a feasibility study, which looks at what we can do to solve the problems. Um, and then the feasibility study really examines a larger universe of options um, that are then kind of narrowed and selected in other documents, namely the proposed plan and finally a record of decision. And there'll be, so we're not there yet, um, and as we get there, there'll be additional um, opportunities for public comment. There's actually a very formal public comment process when we get to the point of looking at how we solve those problems and different options for cleanup. So th thanks, Mark. And, and Rick, if, um, if we weren't able to answer your question, just let us know in the Q&A box. Um, and again, we're happy to circle back on this uh, at the end when we take everyone off of mute or, or give that option. So we did have an, a couple more questions come in. Um, one mentioned that slide 16 did not show results for tribes. Um, so that's a, that's a good catch. And the reason why it, you know, this, this slide shows the um, key results to our exposure groups in the primary risk assessment. We did evaluate risk um, to tribal populations and high subsistence users or high resource users. And those are included in the, um, as appendices in the risk assessment. So the current draft has, includes the appendix for the Colville high resource user, um, just because resource use does differ by population group. Um, and then we currently are working with the Spokane Tribe of Indians on the Spokane Tribal Appendix. Uh, so that will be added at a later date. Um, but I would just add that um, the tribal risks to soil and sediment are, are really similar to the residential or the recreational population and to outdoor workers. Um, but where they really, really differ are um, they reflect much higher um, fish ingestion rates um, and in the case of the call levels, we included um, assessments of specific um, plants that are traditionally used. And those plants are located um, pretty close to the Columbia River, north of North Park, Northport for the most 
part. So that, that's really what's different about those appendices. Is the fish ingestion rates are higher. Um, and then there's um, traditional native plant consumption use added to it. Um, and the, because the fish consumption rates are much higher than what we saw in the, um, in the recreational survey and even the survey of, of the residents of the Colville Indian Reservation, um, the risks are proportionally higher. So um, it's the difference between eating an ounce or two of fish a day to eating a pound or two of fish a day. So it's, it's a very um, different picture, and, and it is included in those appendices. Okay, and then we did have the follow-up question on could you discuss how those compare, I'm assuming, um, referring to the, the tribal users, since it includes workers and recreation and residents. Um, and I think you addressed that partially. Mark, I don't know if you have anything to add. No, I would just reiterate that the really what distinguishes those populations is, is diet. So um, a tribal worker or recreator really those pathways are dominated by exposure to soil and sediment and to a lesser degree river water. And the river water is very clean. So it, it's really the dietary components that um, are very different. And again, it's, it's much different. It's, um, I, I don't have the numbers memorized, but it's the difference between really an ounce and a pound of fish a day. So it, it's, it's a big difference. Um, but it, it wouldn't, um, it, it, it's again, it's, it's a diet difference. It's not a difference um, for breathing air or exposure to soil, sediment, or river water. Um, okay, so I'm going to resume the presentation at slide 17. Um, in slide 17, just uh, it's really an outline for the future slides where um, I talk about risk by um, by fish, by beaches, sediment, surface water. Um, by air, and finally soils. Um, and I'll probably spend more time on soils than the other three because um, we anticipate greater need for action on soil. So with slide 18, um, the fish generally have low levels of lead. There's really one exception to that. Um, which is the large-scale suckers, especially the large-scale suckers that were caught um, in and around Northport and the upper reaches of the river. Um, with the exception of the suckers, most of the concern for fish consumption is based on mercury. Um, and in fish, it's an organic form of mercury called methylmercury, as well as dioxin and dioxin-like PCBs. Um, and we do have, um, I, I believe, uh, the toxicology of the Department of Health gave them the bribe is available for additional questions specific to the fish. But basically, we worked to, um, we sampled a lot of fish in the river, and we shared that data with the Department of Health to really support their advisory. Um, and the state fit-wide fish advisory is on the next slide. Um, it's, it's difficult to explain. We'll just explaining the advisory, it really has two different levels um, because the health effects for mercury are really based on mothers and children. There were studies of, of women who were exposed to mercury and, and the outcomes to their children, generally um, IQ scores and learning ability. Um, so it means that young children and women who are or may become pregnant um, in the advisories issued by the state and other entities um, can't eat as much fish as people as, as um, either older women or adults or adult males um, because, again, the population concern is really young children or um, women who are or may become pregnant. Um, but one of the things we've learned in studying from the Upper Columbia River um, in terms of that risk from mercury, PCBs, and dioxin-like PCBs, um, these are chemicals that move widely through the globe and the region. So. Um, I don't mean to say that these fish are pristine or clean, but they're no different than any other fish within a day's drive of the study area. So, so specifically, the advisory that we supported, based on a lot of very specific fish sampling in the Columbia River, um, doesn't differ from other statewide advisories and other regional advisories affecting all of eastern Washington. So it, it's, no, um, it's no worse at the upper Columbia River from other places. So I mentioned that because it for some reason you have concerns about pollution in the Columbia River, 
going someplace else um, wouldn't really change your risk or exposure. Um, but following the advisory, which is more strict for young children, for women, um, protects you from both the adverse health effects of the mercury in the fish, um, but it's important to really consider the advisories. If the advisories do not say avoid fish because fish represent some of the healthiest foods that we can eat, um, and the foods are healthy in a way um, that's sort of the opposite of the mercury effect. Um, eating fish is really healthy for women and their children, so um, that's why the advisories are always balancing the health effects of the chemicals in the fish with the benefits of the fish themselves. So moving on to slide 20, um, beaches, sediment, and river water. Um, it's much simpler to describe this because there's, there's no health benefit from ingesting sediment or river water. Um, at the same time, there's really no risk from ingesting river water. The, the river water is extremely clean. Um, the beaches for recreation are, are also safe with the exception of Bossbird Flat, which has been closed since we've been aware of that contamination. Um, and again, there's not that much overlap between, um, between the consuming of fish and the other exposure pathways that we looked at in terms of the sediment in the soil, um, because what we're mostly concerned with in the sediment and soil are lead and arsenic, which is just not a problem with the fish. Similarly, um, we don't see mercury and we wouldn't expect to see PCBs or dioxin in the soils or the sediment on the beaches. Um, and again, the risk to workers is, is minimal, and that's a combination of just um, workers are exposed less than residents, um, and workers don't include young children who are most susceptible to these health effects. Moving on to slide 21, um, so we monitored air on the site. Specifically, we looked at concentration of arsenic, cadmium, and lead in the air. Um, and that data and the risk assessment um, was collected between 2002 and 2009. Um, it was collected just on the opposite river, um, across the river from Northport near Sheets Creek. Um, and we really don't see any unacceptable risks from, from inhalation of arsenic, cadmium, or lead in air. Um, and we've also, um, one of the things we're in the process of doing is looking at alternative air concentrations. So we recognize there's some frustration that we're not able to monitor air now, um, but one of the things we are able to do is look at more recent data collected in Canada and then um, project those data directly to, um, to the international border. Um, and we also don't see a problem if we essentially move the monitoring station from Northport directly to the Canadian border. And that's something you'll see um, as we continue to revise the risk assessment. So moving on to the next slide, uh, which will be slide 22. Um, so we sampled a lot of um, upland soil properties. Um, we sampled over 588 residential areas. Um, so we sampled less than 588 properties, um, but we would sample, we generally sampled multiple areas within properties. Um, because many properties are large where we would have sampled a play area separately from the area around the house or if they had a beach or a garden, um, we really relied on the residents to direct us to the places they mostly use. So again, the residential soil sampling was based on exposure and not just um, ownership. And that's an important distinction to make. We really want to focus the area, um, the soil where people are in direct contact to it more often. We also sampled larger areas um, 25 acre areas, they're always standardized and we distribute them up and down the river. Um, and we're looking at those areas as an indication of future residential development. Um, and again, throughout the sample soiling, we see um, exceedances of both lead and non-lead benchmarks. So on slide 23, I'm just giving a little more detail on the results. So um, if you recall the different benchmarks, um, so for current residential exposure, what we see is about 
of the properties exceed that middle benchmark for lead. That's another way of saying 15% of the areas we sampled currently in residential use are above 200 parts per million. Similarly, at the high benchmark, which is 400 parts per million, um, it's greatly reduced with just 2% of current residential properties over that higher benchmark. Um, and one of the reasons why that's not that frequent is because we had 18 properties that would have scored above that high benchmark, but they've already been cleaned, so they're not addressed as contaminated in the risk assessment. The risk assessment is based on conditions today moving forward. Um, so where we've cleaned up properties, they're, they're now clean and they don't contribute to risk. Um, and again, the areas that we're calling future residential um, are more contaminated than current residential. And I think that's because they're also less disturbed. Um, we sampled current residents and future residents really for different and opposite reasons. Um, so the current residential soil sampling was really based on exposure. And because it was based on exposure, the soil surface is more disturbed. So that actually has the effect of diluting the concentration. Um, so for the larger, more remote areas that we're calling future residential, the concentrations appear higher. And they are higher at that surface. But really, um, what that means is that the concentration is all at that surface. Um, because the soil hasn't been worked or disturbed, which would the same amount of lead would probably be in both places, um, but it's just undisturbed all at the surface, so it appears more concentrated on those future residential properties. And it's reflected in those results. So um, slide 24 is the results of those 142 future residential properties. So each one of those dots is actually an area of land that's about 25 acres. Um, and just to explain the key, um, on my screen, um, the orange colors, which tend to be closest to the river and further north, those represent properties that are above 400 parts per million lead. So those are the most contaminated properties. Similarly, the properties um, that were labeled on the figure P5, which is shorthand for um, above 200 parts per million based on a probability of exceeding that blood lead of five micrograms per deciliter for very young children um, represent the blue dot. So those are properties above 200 parts per million. Um, and again, they're kind of also close to the river. And really, the remaining properties, which are in purple, are the cleaner properties. And those represent properties um, that are above 50 parts per million. And those tend to be the properties that are furthest away from the river, which tends to to really funnel um, the contamination that moves through the air it generally follows the Columbia River Valley. So moving on to slide 25, again, we're mostly concerned with um, lead and soil. That's the primary risk driver, especially for current residential and future residential use. But we're really concerned with that current residential use, especially for very young children. Um, we're much less concerned with workers. Um, again, just adults are much less susceptible to health effects of lead. And they're also um, apt to ingest less soil inadvertently than children. Um, but regardless of the soil risk, there are steps you can take on slide 26. Um, and this is really borrowed from the Washington State Department of Ecology that just summarizes common sense ways to reduce your exposure to soil um, in two ways, basically by um, reducing your ingestion rate by keeping both your, your hands um, and your house clean. Um, so these results, these recommendations are really specific for contaminated areas. But I think they just make sense for everyone. So I think we're all interested in having less less soil or dirt in our homes, on our hands, in our food, and in our bodies. Um, so I think at this point, um, I'm going to hand the presentation back to Robert um, and see if we have any additional questions that came in. So. Hi, Mark. This is Robert. Um, I do think this is a, a natural 
break where we can address a question that came in, and that was, do these data imply that the soils could be even higher in lead in Canada? So our investigation was limited only to the um, property south of the U.S. border, U.S.-Canadian border. Uh, so we did not look at, uh, um, I mean, did not conduct any sampling on that side of the Canadian border on the northern portion, um, nor did we model the extent of contamination in Canada. Um, so unfortunately, we can't answer that. I don't know. I know we do have um, members from tech um, who have led investigations in Canada. If they're if they're willing to speak on that behalf, uh, they're um, I, I'd invite them to, to speak, and you can take your phone off of mute by pressing pound six, if so. Okay, so we will have another chance to, to circle back at, at the end of the Q&A portion. Okay, so moving back to slide 27, um, a repeat of our remedial investigation process slide. A reminder again that this is not the end point of it in our remedial investigation. It is um, the end point of the human health risk assessment, which is a portion of the overall investigation. We are expecting, as I mentioned, to have public comment open and accept comments to through July 24th. Um, as also mentioned, the Spokane Tribe of Indians appendix is a currently under development uh, in cooperation with the Spokane Tribe of Indians, and we're hoping to have that complete this summer. And then including responses to feedback um, that we received during the comment period and any subsequent revisions to the risk assessment report, we are targeting to have that complete by, two de by the end of the year. The ecological risk assessment is still ongoing. Um, the phase three sediment study was completed in 20, or this year, and we are expecting the final report in 2022. And then ongoing uh, is our soil amendment technology evaluation. And that's uh, a study that's being jointly conducted by EPA and tech to examine uh, different potential soil amendments that have the ability to, um, in, uh, to immobilize lead in soil and, and reduce the toxicity. So that's currently under development um, through the through a lab bench scale study, and we're uh, intending to move out into the field by 2023, have that completed. The draft human health risk assessment report is available on EPA's site profile webpage for the Upper Columbia River site. You can access that using the link on this slide. Um, if, if unable to copy the link. Um, you can also Google EPA Upper Columbia River site and it should take you to our site profile page. We are accepting feedback through July 24th and comments should be submitted uh, to me, Robert Tan at tan.robert at epa.gov. Uh, if you are unable to email comments, um, please reach out and uh, to me, my contact information is included at the end of this presentation and also on our EPA webpage um, and we can discuss alternative methods to submit comments. And then as a non-requirement, but something that certainly is helpful, I, I'd recommend folks include HHRA comments in the subject line to help me as a personal favor, keep track of comments as they come in. And then comments uh, after July 24th, we'll be working with our team to uh, evaluate comments and uh, provide response, which will appear in, append in an appendix to the final risk assessment report. So I'm on slide 29, and it's labeled feedback examples. On this slide, we've got two examples of comments um, that are fairly typical that we that receive on sites like this where we have public comment periods. The first comment um, is an example of a constructive comment that is helpful to our project team in making substantive changes to the risk assessment report. Comment repeat, reads, the report lumps all fish species together. It'd be helpful to consider risk from ingesting specific fish species. So this comment is an example of one that's specific and actionable and uh, really helps us out. 
The second comment is a little bit more terse, and it reads, this report is wrong. And that is an example that I would caution you um, to elaborate on that response and uh, in your comments explain why it may be wrong and what specifically we can uh, do to correct any aspect of the specific report. So at that point, uh, we are at the end of the presentation, so we will uh, turn the microphone over to Kay to um, read any comments that came in. Thanks, Robert. Um, there are a couple of questions <clears throat> in the question box, and um, before I read them, I'd like to encourage people to continue to put any questions that you have in the um, Q&A box. <clears throat> Excuse me, and after I read the two questions that are in the, um, in the question box, um, I'm going to encourage folks to take themselves off of mute. And the way that you would do that is to wake up your phone and go to the keypad and press pound six. So the pound six will unmute yourself, and then you should be able to speak. And I'll give you a little time to, to wake up your phone while I read these couple of other questions. Um, the first question is, um, is a map available for beaches samples that is similar to the upland soil data presented on slide 24? Is that something that Robert can, can answer? Hi, so Joe, uh, this is Robert, and I actually do not believe that we have a beach-specific map <laughs> developed. Um, there have been a couple different sampling efforts that have targeted beaches. Um, so we don't currently have that. Okay. The next question would be from Jessica. Which pathways are causing the most risk? Fits fish consumption versus soil and sediment exposure? So this is Mark. I'll try to answer that. And um, I apologize in advance if it's not a clear answer. It's, it's different, so it's hard to compare. Um, with soil, we're concerned about lead exposure to young children, which isn't a problem for fish unless the young child is, is eating large-scale suckers, um, which is probably unlikely, at least based on our surveys. We had very large surveys. Um, we, we literally surveyed thousands of people, probably between two and thousand, two and 3,000 people, and I don't think we found a single um, consumer of large-scale suckers. So again, that's not to say people don't, but it just, um, that would be a concern. So if a young child, um, or, or even um, a mother of a young child who, or a woman who could be pregnant was consuming large quantities of large-scale sucker, that would be a very large health concern, and it would trump generally the soil concentrations, but that's really the exception to the rule. Um, the other fish consumption risks are, um, are really vary with species, but they're no different than risks throughout eastern Washington or western Idaho or, or really throughout the whole Pacific Northwest region. Um, and that's because the mercury is really in global circulation. Mercury is it's a volatile biocumulative compound, so, so we just see it everywhere. So I don't mean to dismiss those risks, but my point is is they're, they're largely unavoidable. You can moderate them by choosing fish that, um, that don't eat other fish um, and referring to the DOH advisory because that's how it's arranged. Um, and then in terms of soil versus sediment, um, generally the soil concentrations are higher than the sediment, and I think that's because the metals that would have ended up in the soil through aerial deposition from the trail and other sources, um, they basically stay there and they're persistent. They don't get washed away readily. They don't leach into the soil and they just remain. Um, and that's why sediment is cleaner than soil. The, the sediment um, is generally washed constantly, so that aerial deposition component isn't there. And I would believe that most of the metals um, in the sediment are probably residuals from slag and they tend to be less contaminated than, than the aerial deposition pathway. Um, so I hope that, that answers Jessica's question. Uh, it's possible Thanks, that the Department of Health may be able to add to that as well. 
Um, I did want to interrupt briefly. Um, I can read one more question before I go to the phone. And I do want to let folks know that we can stay on the line for another half an hour. So if people, um, you know, continue to have questions that um, um, we haven't answered yet, um, we can stick around. It we're, we're just a couple of minutes before the bottom of the hour, and, uh, and I just wanted to let you know that. Um, the next question, before I go to the phone, uh, Jamie asks, can you just give us a very simplified answer? Are community members in danger from long-term exposure? Oh, hi, this, this is, is Mark. Robert. Oh. Go ahead, Robert. Mark, Mark let, let me take a stab, and then uh, you can add on. Um, sure. You know, to answer that question, looking at specifically at the risk assessment of what we've done is, you know, is I think we can rephrase that question to ask, in our comparison of risk to benchmarks, are there areas where risk exceeds our health-based benchmarks? And the short answer is yes. And as Mark mentioned, that's primarily in the northern portion of the site and residential properties that are in the impacted footprint. Uh, this is Mark, and I, I don't think I can really add to that. Again, just echoing our, our primary concern is young children in soil. Um, and that's not to say there isn't a concern, um, but we're somewhat comforted that the highest, the most contaminated properties uh, have already been remediated. Um, so, so, um, and they were remediated down to, I believe, 600 parts per million. Um, so prior to that, um, we had concentrations, a few of them above 1,000 parts per million. So, so the maximum concentrations across the site are, are not that high. And again, we're being protective for um, preschool children, so those risks are, are very um, less of a concern for adults. Um, and, and that's really what I think subsequent steps in the process will focus on, on the most contaminated residential soil areas first. But I guess there's not because there's no threshold for lead, it's, it's a continuum. So these are, um, the site is cleaner than before the removals and and, um, and again, that risk is really targeted on the preschool. That, that remains our main concern. Um, again, we would want to make the environment safe for preschool children everywhere and not just make it sound like um, we're only concerned in areas of soil contamination with our preschool children on those properties. Our goal is to make the properties safe for all people. Thank you, Mark. Um, so I'd like to invite people um, on the phone to please feel free to speak up. Um, again, you'll need to take your phone off mute by pressing pound six. Um, and that should unmute your phone, and you can go ahead and speak up. And while I'm waiting for folks to take their phones off of mute, um, uh, I do want to let you know that um, the same material that we're covering today will be covered in the July 15th meeting, um, the same webinar. So, um, you know, if there are additional questions that you think up later and you want to participate in that meeting, you're welcome to. Um, also, I'll do a, I'll get a summary of today's um, questions and answers and get that out by email to the people who registered for this um, for this presentation. I'm also willing to read any more questions that we might get from um, through the Q and A uh, panel on the on the webinar. We do have one more that I'll read. Have you focused primarily on lead 
is cancer risk from ingestion of arsenic within acceptable cancer risk levels for tribal populations? This is from Diane. Robert, is this one you'd like to take? Uh, this is Mark. I was just struggling with my mute button. Can you? It looks like yes. you can hear me now. Yes, we can. Thank you. And now we can. And um, oh no, I was just um, I think it depends on the exposure media, and and I think generally um, the ingestion of soil doesn't vary significantly between tribal and non-tribal populations, and arsenic doesn't occur in fish. Um, but as I recall, arsenic is a problem in some of the tribal exposure pathways. Um, specifically, it's a problem in root plants. Um, generally, the berries and leaves were fairly uncontaminated. Um, I think one exception to that is sarvis or service berries had a problem. And I don't recall if that was a lead or an arsenic problem or both. Um, and then one of the most contaminated native plants that we um, discovered, I'm not sure if it's a plant or not, but it, it's referred to as black lichen. So it, it's actually a lichen that grows on trees. Um, and that had fairly substantial levels of lead. Um, but the point is, is those are all uniquely, generally, we're viewing them as uniquely tribal exposure pathways. And they, that's where the problems are, in, in the root vegetation um, and in the lichen. And, and I believe in the service berries. Um, and again, um, arsenic, um, the fish we actually analyzed for both inorganic and organic arsenic. And um, I'm sorry, for total arsenic and inorganic arsenic, and all the fish throughout the site came up non-detect. So arsenic in fish is not a problem for anyone tribal, recreational, or anyone on the site. Diane, you can let us know. Thanks. Yeah, if you could let us know if that covers um, your question. I see that you followed up with um, a question that you were thinking about the harvesting of root plants. So um, if you'd like to let us know if we've answered it completely or not, um, that would be great. And uh, Mindy um, sends her thank you to us. Thank you. Right back to you, Mindy. And I, I hey, think this is Mark. The, the I just want to add that the the root, the root plants that we sampled really were targeted um, very close to Northport and Mitchell Road. So um, I don't want to imply that roots are a problem everywhere. So we really focused um, our sampling at, on the most contaminated areas generally. So, so that's where we're aware there are problems. So I don't want people to generalize that there are problems everywhere. Thanks, Mark. Um, sorry. And to add on to that, I think it's a nice way not to put any of our partners on the spot here. Um, but I know that the Colville Confederated Tribes, Cindy Marchand and her team, have worked to put together fact sheets and materials that kind of summarize those tribal risks um, to subsistence resource users. Um, and you know, her contact information is uh, contained on the slide here. Uh, encouraged to reach out to her if you have any follow-up questions. Tamara Knudsen with the Spokane Tribe is also a key partner in this project and, and would be able to help answer some of those questions if you've got specific um, concerns over traditional resource use. Since I haven't um, heard anyone speak up, I'm a little bit concerned that maybe the um, the self unmuting with pound six is not working, so I'm going to try to unmute everybody and see if um, if anyone would like to speak up um, to ask any questions. So let me give that a try. The leader has unmuted your line. Looks like everybody has been unmuted and you're still quite quiet, so please feel free to ask a question should you have one. Hi, this is Dave McBride from Department of Health. 
Dave, thanks. Hi. Hi. Um, not a question so much as um, just some information about fish um, contaminant levels uh, in the Upper Columbia and like Roosevelt versus other places in Washington. Um, if we go further down the Columbia, um, we have data sets, that I think starting from about Bridgeport down to the Bonneville Dam. And what we're seeing is that levels of contaminants are much higher uh, in those that, in that section of the, the Columbia than in the Upper Columbia, which is, I think, great news for the for the Upper Columbia. Um, many of the fish advisories that we have in the kind of what we're calling the midsection of the Columbia are much more restrictive than uh, the Upper Columbia. So I just wanted to add that. Thank you. Does anyone else have any comments that they would like to um, add? This is Elmer Matthijs, uh in um, northeastern Washington. I'm in Colville area. And my question is, in looking into the future and uh, for future generations, will the uh, fish ever be um, safe to eat without any advisories at all? Will this, all these heavy metals and everything that are in the entire Columbia system in many other waterways, according to what you're saying, is this going to resolve itself, or we're always going to have advisories on fish? I can take a shot at that. Uh, again, this is Dave McBride. Um, well, it's likely that uh, some of the contaminants do have half-life in the environment, like PCBs, and I think we've seen if you look at osprey eggs, where researchers have studied them and contaminant levels in osprey eggs, that we see levels of some of the organic, such as PCBs, have dropped significantly. They're kind of plateauing at very low levels um, that may or may not impact fish advisories. Um, it's a little bit harder to say with mercury because of the global distribution of mercury from um, we're still having increases of use of coal-fired power plants uh, around the world. And as long as that's occurring, as long as that's increasing, we're likely to have more mercury deposition um, throughout the world. Thank you. So just one clarification on one of the questions we received earlier about uh, the um, map of soil data for the public beaches. Um, to elaborate on the response, it does look like we do have um, a, a specific map in the risk assessment report that focuses on the results for residential beaches, uh, but we do not have a comprehensive map of all residents showing the results for residential and any of the public beaches that were sampled together. Well, perhaps we could take that as a constructive comment on the risk assessment. Yes, you could. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, hi, this is Michelle with uh, the Cobble Tribe Fish and Wildlife Department, and. Um, in my position, I do a lot of uh, work with uh, getting information out to the community on things that we, we do. And um, I'm just wondering in what ways are you guys sharing your information with the public? I mean, I see that you have that um, information on what fish to eat and how much the fish advisory, um, but what other ways are you guys getting that information out to the public. So hi, that, that's, a, that's a great question. And to answer it, you know, we, we rely heavily on our, the cooperative efforts of our project team that includes members of the Colville Confederated Tribe, the Spokane Tribe, Washington Department of Ecology, 
and then Tech American Incorporated. And all of us have jointly worked together to public fact sheets um, and you know, results from our investigations as we have them available and as it's embedded. Um, so this is, you know, this, this webinar is certainly one opportunity that we've taken advantage of to help kind of share those results. We conducted uh, another public meeting uh, back in October in Northport, really aimed at uh, residents in that area that are heavily impacted. Um, so to answer it, it is a little, and admittedly it is a little scattered, our public information at this point, um, but we, we work with our, our partners to put that together too. So for specific impacts to, um, you know, that are relevant and um, impacts tribal users, we work with Cindy and her team to, to get that information out and then disseminate it. Um, this might be a, a, a question that, that um, Dave can add a bit to, but if I remember correctly, I think there are um, signs about the fish advisories all up and down the, the lake um, in the recreational areas. And um, I, I'm not sure about this. Dave, you might be able to answer. Um, is Does the fish advisory go out to folks who are purchasing fishing licenses? Yeah, so um, we, we have worked with the Department of Interior on a uh, specific um, uh, signage for um, Lake Roosevelt, and um, we worked with the Colville Tribe on uh, on helping them develop a, a, a great calendar. I'm not sure if that's still uh, in effect nowadays or not, but that was a, a great piece for for getting the message out to tribal individuals. Uh, we have a a web page um, and a mobile kind of app for fish advisories. Uh, that includes the Upper Columbia and Lake Roosevelt, so that's available on a, on someone's smartphone if they wanted to check that out as well. Do you post this information on your Facebook page or um, something that we could easily share to our Facebook pages? Um, you know, I don't believe we have this on Department of Health Facebook page, but I could check into that in the future. And there, there's a cost associated with them printing out that calendar. I love those, but they don't do them anymore, and I've been asking about that as well. Um, but yeah, anything that we could easily share to community members, um, you, we'd like. I mean, I would love, love to get that stuff. Okay. Yeah, it would be great to revise that calendar again. I thought that was a great piece and uh, very effective. I thought. Yes. Thank you. I've got a couple more questions. Um, Mindy adds um, that newsletters are prepared by the Lake Roosevelt Forum and the Citizens for Clean Columbia that also try to keep people informed. And the uh, Lake Roosevelt Forum has a, a conference that, um, I don't know, Andy, if you want to um, speak up about um, how often, I think it's about every 18 months or so these days. Um, and before you speak up, um, Mindy also reminds us that the Citizens for Clean Columbia does have a Facebook page as well, and uh, and that might be another resource for you to share. Do we have other questions? Please feel free to speak up. Well, we sure appreciate everybody um, sticking with us uh, straight through. Um, we really didn't lose very many folks during the course of this presentation, so um, I appreciate it very much. Um, if it, if you um, have questions later, please don't hesitate to send them to Robert. Um, again, that's tan.robert at epa.gov um, for questions or, or comments um, about the, uh, the risk assessment. And um, 
Oh, looks like so thank you, Kate. And just to clarify, it, it read and Andy responded and clarified that the <laughs> next Laker Result Forum conference is scheduled for April 2021, and that the Laker Result Forum is currently working on a public guide to summarize the HHRA. So we definitely appreciate their help on that. Thank you so much, Andy. Great. Robert, do you have anything else that you would like to add or, or Mark, do you, before we wrap up? No, I'd like to again just thank everyone for making some time on a, on a Wednesday night to uh, join this webinar. And I'd encourage folks, if they have any questions, the Human Health Risk Assessment uh, Report is a very technical document that is the combination of a dozen or so separate reports. Um, and so, you know, we have posted separately, and it went live today, the link to just the executive summary. Um, just uh, which which may be easier to download and and, and start. Um, I know that the combined report is a massive document um, that uh, my my personal computer had issues downloading. So, you know that that's one approach to look at. And then if anyone has any questions, you're you know we we encourage them to reach out to myself or Mark 